Hey, this is a perfect setting for an old dude like me. I'm a really old guy, by the way. Me, Xi Jinping, and Vladimir Putin have one thing in common. We're all 70. The, uh, but in the BBC, I was born with a face for radio. Yeah, works a treat. Yeah, it's just simple. Yeah. And as to the idea, oh, by the way, you also look at the old, you think, yeah, definitely never done a dry January in his life. <laughs> never intend to ever do a dry January in his life as it goes through. Who's read the book, The Year 1805? It was first published in 1869. Probably because he changed the title to War and Peace. The title was originally The Year of 1805. What's great about Tolstoy's book is he absolutely nailed the bloody problem. His title is not War and Peace or War or Peace, it's War and Peace. It's not either or. The common state of affairs is war and peace. And yet we all sit here having had some nice things to eat and still waiting for a cup of coffee, Sophia, but not a worry at the end of the day. The, uh, and it's as if, you know, sort of everything's just, it's cool. Everything's fine. Got up this morning, woke up, that's a good style. Yeah, got on the train, the train actually was on time. Got here, no trouble. You, and yet, and yet, the very fabric of our society, the very, you might say, the sort of genesis of 1648 and the Westphalian Pact is under direct attack and assault. Sun Tzu, that very dull, Chinaman, but very thoughtful fella, writer, scholar, all that sort of stuff, yeah, once said something along the lines, and I never get it right yet, but he said something along the lines which said, if one nation is at war and the other nation doesn't know it's at war, the nation that is at war has the advantage and normally wins. And you think, oh, it's a bit like it's sort of, you know, water will flow to the low ground. You know, <laughs> come on. Yeah, of course it's going to go to the low ground. Really a statement of the obvious. But if you think about a statement about war, how could one nation not know it was at war? Oh, we know what war looks like. You get images out of Gaza. You get images out of Ukraine. You look at the D-Day landings. You look at Vietnam. You look at a whole range of things, Iraq, Afghanistan, all the sort of what I call the downside, the violence of it. But how could a nation not know it was at war? Because that's how we perceive war, an attack upon ourselves, upon our way of life, our prosperity, an attack against our people. Yet the truth of the matter is, we're just being undone from within. If I read another broadsheet which tells me that in fact that Britain's lost, can't do anything right, we're a loser nation, we should never have been around, da 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 You know, you just give it the old, is the glass half full, the glass half empty? The water's exactly the same. But there's negativity. You don't get positivity doesn't sell the newspaper, negativity does. And oh, the media is just a business. I get that. Got no difficulty with it. But it's just a business. It sells copy, it sells airtime. And so this negativity gets drawn upon us. The great disadvantage we have is we are open societies, we're democratic societies, we come from, in fact, what I call arrangements, which looks towards, in fact, the structure of democracy, but it's more about liberty. It's about freedom. It's about rights, obligations, responsibilities, the very simple things in life, and they are being undone. So, a year ago, I sort of had a talk. I didn't realize we had 10 of these things going on so far, yes? Yeah? So the ninth edition, and I turned around. People said, so what do you see? 
as to the context, the circumstance, the framework in which every one of you individually and collectively as your companies sit. And I said, as we came out of COVID, the new reality is persistent uncertainty in the immediate and the near term. Where do I see that a year on? Simply, in the immediate, the near term, and the foreseeable future. I'll be dead before anything starts to stabilize. Persistent uncertainty in politics, in social, in financial, in economic, just keep ticking, military and technology, just keep ticking the list off, everything is in flux. It's all moving, very difficult to predict. And we thought, now this is people coming out with COVID, they say, oh, when we're on the other side of COVID, I said, oh, no, 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 you're not going back to something. It's already moved on and I'm seeing it moving in an uncertain, an unsettled way. Now, there's a guy who wrote a book, or was known to be, if I can find it, a German called Henry, Henry Metz Mintzberg, an author of The Rise and Fall of Strategic Planning, who said, who suggested that setting oneself on a predetermined course on unknown waters is a perfect way to sail straight into an iceberg which is precisely what the Titanic did on the 14th of April, 1912. And yet, everything I look at out there tells me that it's uncertain, and yet we keep on looking for certainty. It doesn't exist. What you've got to work out is how you operate in a rel relatively chaotic set of circumstances on all fronts all the time and forever and long after I'm dead. So second thing I said last year, I turned around and said, oh, people asked me and said, oh, you know, when, because I'm an old soldier, yeah? they said, you know, you must be really disappointed when America pulled out, or we all pulled out of Afghanistan. They said, you know, you must be really angry. I said, you're asking me the wrong question. I said, oh, you know, you must, well, you must be angry that, you know, I said, stop, you're asking me the wrong question. They said, eventually, he said, so what is the question I need to ask you? I said, did I do my duty? That's the question. And the answer is yes. It's not about winning or losing. And they said, but I said, understand this. The implications of us coming out of Afghanistan and the circumstances that unfolded there untidy tragic as they were, I said the probability is that an unnecessary decision taken by the President of the United States of America, which we then locked in with, the probability is that the next president will be a Republican. And the possibility is it will be Donald Trump. Where do I sit a year later? The probability is the next president of the United States of America will be a Republican. And my view is the probability is it'll be Donald Trump. Now, a lot of people say, I don't like Donald Trump. And you say, and that's voiced openly, Europeans. We don't have a vote in America. What America votes is for the president they want, the president we get, we work with whoever we've got. You play the hand you're given. So if you want to work with Donald Trump and work with America, then the truth of it is recognize how and what circumstances, therefore, without kowtowing or breaking down or throwing away sort of, you know, the values you hold and all the rest here, how you work with America. But expect the probability from where I sit irrespective of whatever court cases are running, the 14th Amendment, keep ticking the list off, the probability from where I sit is it's gonna be a Republican, and the probability is it's gonna be after last yesterday's New Hampshire event is gonna be Donald Trump. So work out how you work with America. 
don't stand there being angry because we are, ultimately we work with Russia in the United States. We work with all sorts of players that we don't like. North Korea. Just get smart. And don't stand there with arms reversed, angry of Europe or angry of Britain or angry of whatever the case may be. Because the truth of the matter is, in fact, as I said, I think that's going to be the outcome as it stands. I also said last year, I said, oil and gas prices will be kept up. Why? Because it's really important to Vladimir Putin and currently, in fact, on a war economy with Russia, that he, in fact, remains cashed up because the economy is not in great shape. But he's got lots of money on the basis that, in fact, I don't know what the euro was the other day. It was about 78. So in which case, actually, no, wrong. Brent was about 78. So the euro is about 58 on the barrel. He needs the money. And so last year, it was all about keeping oil and gas prices up. Oh, it's going to be a cold winter. It's not going to be, you're not going to get access to this. Or as it went through, as it stood, yeah. Where do I see it now? As I go into this, yeah. Oil and gas prices being forced up by design. Not happen chance, not sort of, oh, that's a bit unfortunate, but by design. Now, I'm not a big conspiratorial guy. I don't look around and think, oh, here's a guy sitting there or a gal sitting there with a white cat, giving it the old, I've got a grand plan to take over the world. Harold Macmillan once said, you know, what was the things that hit him as a politician? He said, events, dear boy event. And that's how it applies to all of you. The events unfold, you have to respond and act accordingly. But I look at a series of inclinations, a change in circumstances, because the world I see, I do some work with Yale University, the old football team, really good. Yeah. It, uh, about two years ago, we're sitting at Gettysburg, and I turn around and say, in 18, wherever it was, when Gettysburg kicked off in 64, I said, you know, here was a divided nation. And I said to people, I said, what have you got today? America's a divided nation. Literally, I mean, it's really narrow between the Republican and the Democrat. But as I look towards this year, what I see incredibly, or increasingly so, is a divided world. Have nots, haves, haves not, have. I look across and see, in fact, what I call two, not like the old Cold War, which I grew up in, which was ideologically separated into two blocks, but I see a forming difference between, in many ways, old, you might say, Europe and America and the likes, the West, really bad term, but that's how we capture it, and a new East. I look at BRICS, established in 2009 by uh, Vladimir Putin, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Suddenly take on KSA, take on UAE, take on Egypt, gonna take Morocco, take Algeria, yeah. Oh, that's half the world's population with a third of the world's GDP. Headquarters is in Quanzhou or Shanghai, I can't remember, I think Shanghai. They've got a different view. So how you fit into that really, really matters. And then the challenge that you face, last year I turned around and said, listen, we all know ransomware, we all get the sort of we're a wanna cries and the North Koreans and get money and this sort of stuff. Yeah, we saw Russia and all the rest. Yeah, I said, what's happening I'm seeing now is state level interests in you individually in this room and your businesses collectively. Not casually, not, you know, sort of like something out of a movie set, but quite clearly, in fact, saying, who are you, who do you represent, and how can I access? Where do you sit and where's that company stand? And what I see is that before it was state interest and criminal activity, this year I see state influence and criminality. 
with a clear view that you represent, we represent, you all represent in this room, that which in fact basically keeps our half, our ideology, our views, our freedoms, our liberties, our responsibilities alive because we're economically viable, actually in fact, and people see this as a good thing. But that has changed to one of now state influence. And I believe that that's just going to increase. So everything I'm saying is that things haven't got better, they haven't stayed the same. What I'm telling you is everything is just getting worse. And don't think there's any pause in the getting worse part. You have almost a sort of, wrong term would be the Cold War, but you have a re-emergence of two great forces hitting off against each other, one which wants a change to their own view. And if you haven't read the joint statement by Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping written on the 4th of February 2022, 20 days before he went into Ukraine, if you haven't read that, read it, because it tells you what the design for that enterprise is. It's different. They talk about world institutions, they talk about democracy, they talk about things which we would all recognize, but they see it in a completely different way. And autocratic governments, a bit like George Bernard Shaw once said, the world is run by men who don't want you. They want the world to conform to them, the unreasonable man and unreasonable woman. So that's the world as I see it as it comes now. Middle East, I said last year, it was all about stressing energy. Events have unfolded after the tragedy and the slaughter on the 7th of October, but my view is that opportunists are still seeking to stress energy in the Middle East. Whether it's more fuel to go around the south, whether it's in effect what I call the up price on in fact coming through the Red Sea, whatever it may be, but generally a sense that in fact, that you keep on having to keep the prices up because that pays for, in this case, Putin's war and maintains for many others in the commercial space, economic advantage that they otherwise wouldn't have. So, everybody's focused on Gaza right now. It needs to be resolved one way or the other. It needs to, in fact, not be a temporary truce. It doesn't need to be something that extends on and through. But it needs to, in fact, come to some sort of resolution fairly soon. But if you ask me what is more important, not a tragedy of lives lost because that's a wrong matrix to look at this. But as I see it from where we sit and the setting in which you stand, it's Ukraine. Everybody's forgotten about Ukraine. Why? Why does Ukraine matter? You had the NATO chief the other day turning around and saying, we need to increase the size of NATO. Europe saying, we need to have a European army. We need to have more sort of bigger army. And you turn and say, I'm a military guy. I get this stuff. You go, no, 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 no. The answer is, how did Putin stop the Ukrainians offensive of 2023 succeeding? He just did old fashioned, good old fashioned Russian approach to in fact, three lines of defense. Bang, bang, bang. They couldn't break through it. Everybody's disappointed. I wasn't surprised at all. If you want to contain Russia, have three lines of defense on the other side, in exactly the same format Brit built by the Ukrainians, which they wouldn't want to do, which then means that Russia cannot extend its influence into Ukraine and will continue to be contained there in money, cost, time, blood, and treasure. And yet we're just looking at the situation where maybe in fact 
President Trump will say, we're out of Ukraine. If you don't want to go to war with Russia, just turn around to Ukraine and say, five years, we Europeans are going to fund you, not recklessly, and we're going to continue to support you, and we'll help you build three lines of defense. My final point is three lines of defense. If you don't have defense in depth, it breaks. The Russians proved that. And the three lines of defense, we all know, and we say it every time for the last 10 years at these summits, yeah, we turn around and say, hey, the reality is you'd need to sort out your homework and your husbandry and good housekeeping in your own businesses. You have to double down and double down again on getting that right. Everybody says it, no one really does it. You need to really bring a level of enforcement with the sophistication of chat GBT and all the rest that comes in there, which really sounds like me on the other end of, in fact, a line, whatever it may be, to be able to stop fissing and all the rest that goes through. You've then got to go to the other end and turn around and say, who can compete against state level enterprises? Well, it's the big boys. It's Microsoft. It's Google. These guys, yeah, they're putting billions and billions of dollars into safeguarding the systems that you then use. And then I would say this, and it doesn't have to be ITC, but you need a third part. You need the third leg to the stool, which is looking at your business and able to help you either with what's happening globally, regionally, nationally, has access to, in fact, the best that we have out of, in the UK, in effect, the cyber centers, GCHQ and all the rest, to be able to therefore assist that. Because only by putting those three lines of defense might you slow down the assault that is coming. I'm out of time. One final thought, just to show you how my brain works. You think of all the data that's been stolen, borrowed, taken. A pile of that data is encrypted. State to State Department, Foreign Office to Foreign Office, diplomatic channels, all safe. You watch what happens to democracy and our values, where that information is then, in fact, broken down with quantum encryption, de-encryption, and turns around and starts to present to allies, to alliances, and to friends what we say about each other. I can look at what's happening in American politics. I can look at what's happening in UK in politics. I can look at what's in Europe. I can see what's happening in Ukraine. I can see what's happening in Gaza. These are all tragic events, or in fact, what are called changes in scenes and history. But if you ask me what would be an event of massive disruption that would cripple, in effect, dem dem democracy and the Western states and the companies you represent, well, it's in the field you're in, IT and cyber. If it goes wrong, collectively, individually, all is lost. So in many ways, I can go across and talk to the MOD, I can talk to the Foreign Office, do whatever the case may be here. Yeah? Answer is, they are just sideshows. If there was ever a real deal, it's you and what you do and this space of cyber and information technology. All the rest is just noise. Thank you.